The U.S. economy is absolutely booming. At the same time, the U.S. economy is really struggling. If you listen to Federal Reserve officials or just the mainstream media, it's only the former. The U.S. economy seems to be doing really well, strong numbers across the board. Federal Reserve officials are now afraid, more afraid of consumer prices breaking out than they are of a soft patch or recession. Or at least that's what they say in public. In public, Federal Reserve officials are aggressively hawkish again after flip-flopping back and forth several times in recent months. In private, Federal, First, Federal Reserve officials and their staff are expressing increasing concerns about the shape of the economy. Just this week, the Beige Book came out for the month of April 2024, and in it was a whole bunch of cold water on the U.S. economy. Now, of course, these are... These are just anecdotes that are compiled by the various Federal Reserve branches, and there is some positive aspects to it, as well as some of these more concerning uh, reports that are going along that, that are included in it. And I'll give you an example here. While everyone says, you know, focus on GDP, focus on payrolls, the Beige Book says in its summary, its overall national summary, employment rose at a slight pace overall with nine districts reporting very slow to modest increases, and the remaining three districts reporting no changes in empl employment. Most districts noted increases in labor supply and in the quality of job applicants, that's great, but several districts reported improved ret retention of employees and others pointed to staff reductions at some firms. In other words, the labor market doesn't sound at all like the well above every single expectation every single month for the payroll report. There does seem to be a real dichotomy here between what's expressed in some of the mainstream numbers and what we continue to see and feel in a lot of other data, as well as anecdotes and our impression of the conditions on the ground. So Steve, Steve Van Meter, what do you make of this difference between how it seems like there's two different worlds? You know, it's the same planet, different worlds for the, U the US economy most of all, but in some places else around, some other places around the world too. Yeah, Jeff, it's kind of weird because we're seeing these big headline numbers and you get the impression that the U.S. economy is, well, indeed turned into an island compared to the rest of the world. For some reason, everyone else is struggling, but yet we're booming. But when you peel back the layers and you start looking at these survey reports, you get an entirely different picture that says, no, wait a minute, we're not booming. We're slowing down here. The question really becomes is which one of these is real? And that's the challenge is we don't really actually know. We can look at other data and say, well, it looks like the survey reports are indeed more accurate here. But the only then question becomes is when does the headline numbers actually reflect it? Because every time we get a new payroll report or inflation print, well, it actually kind of suggests the economy is booming. And then we get another report from a survey saying that, well, maybe we're laying off a few more people here or new orders are dropping or hours worked are falling. And it just doesn't add up. But I have a hunch pretty soon it's going to make sense. Well, let's, okay, let's set aside this one part. Okay, let's separate, say, the CPI from GDP. Let's talk about the CPI for a moment because I think that's a big, big part of the problem that we're having here is that everybody has been led to believe that a high level of consumer price growth equals a booming economy. That if you do have a CPI that's, say, around 3%, that must mean that there's an overheating of activity within the system that needs the Federal Reserve to come in and slam on the brakes and slow everything down. We have that impression, and it's understandable why we have that impression, because we're given that impression in every single thing and every single time that you hear it. Uh, anyone talking about either consumer prices or the real economy. So we have this idea that the CPI means if it's, if it's too hot or too high, the economy must be really strong. But when you stop and look at what's keeping the CPI from going down even further, it's not a booming economy. It's either shelter prices or oil prices, meaning gasoline prices. And we can talk about shelter prices all day, but there's really no there's really no corroborating evidence to what the BLS puts in the CPI or the PCE deflator from the BEE as far as rents. We see that rents around the rest of the country are flat to slightly lower. And we hear from a lot of builders who are saying we've got to give big concessions just to get people to come into and to have a chance of filling up any new projects. So the idea that rents are increasing at half a percent every single month just doesn't square with reality. 
And then the other big part is, of course, gasoline and oil prices. Gasoline and oil prices, while some people are saying they've had a good run here because demand seems to be picking up, or the oil market is thinking demand will be picking up, well, we see in every, every time that there's a Middle East factor that shows up, you know, in a less, an escalation in Iran versus Israel, oil prices go up. And then when that calms down, oil prices go back down, which suggests that it's not really demand that's driving uh, gasoline and oil prices higher. Of course, gasoline has seasonal factors. But the point I'm making here is that by and large, the inflation that everybody thinks we have is in those two things. And those two things are not a booming economy. Absolutely, Jeff, because, you know, as someone who does rent, I can tell you, as a matter of fact, rents aren't going up. My rent hasn't changed in wealth since I started renting. It hasn't gone up one penny. Now, I do know people whose rents are rising, and I get that. But looking around to talking to people Steve, that... Steve, 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 wait. You're in, an, you're in an undesirable area. Nobody wants to move to Orlando. You're right, Jeff. This is one of the most undesirable places in the world. No one wants to live here. But what we're seeing is the fact that there's some of these projects are not completed and they're running out of money. And I know for a fact that people who are developers are taking borrowing against existing projects that are completed and taking out loans at high interest rates to try to finish these other product projects, knowing that they have no clue where they're going to get the people to fill it. And that's one of the interesting challenges is, and then you mentioned energy, which I want to comment on here in a second, but there's also insurance. People have started saying, hey, my car insurance, my home insurance rates have gone up a bunch. Well, where does that money come out of? Your discretionary spending. Same with the energy. You raise gas prices. If people's wages aren't really going up enough or their hours worked aren't rising enough, they can't afford it, but they have no choice. And so all these things, as you said, are feeding into inflation that look on the headline says U.S. economy booming. Well, that's going to likely reverse because the challenge is it's going to come at the sacrifice of discretionary spending. And when that hits, well, more people are unfortunately going to lose their job, lose their spending power. And any inflationary pulse here is going to rapidly disappear. It's funny you mentioned discretionary spending because that is another topic that was brought up in the Beige Book. The Beige Book cited discretionary spending in particular because of all the reasons that we're talking about here. What the quote, quote said was, consumer spending barely increased overall, but reports were mixed across districts and spending categories. Spending reports mentioned weakness in discretionary spending as consumers' price sensitivity remained elevated. And when they, when they talk about price sensitivity, they're talking about exactly what you just said, Steve, right? It's, hey, my insurance went up. Uh, my wages aren't going up to make up for it. Gasoline prices are going up. My wages aren't going up to make up for it. I got to cut back somewhere else. My discretionary spending. I can't go out to eat like I wanted to. I can't go on vacation or at least the same expenses. I can't go visit Steve in Orlando because I can't afford to. And so there's a huge, huge negative impact. That's not inflation. That's price pressures that lead to actually disinflation. When you disentangle all of these things from the CPI and the narrative that a high CPI actually means a booming economy, you start to see what the Beige Book is actually talking about. You know, it's interesting, Jeff, because when you get price increases that aren't matched with wage increases, it turns out to be disinflationary. Now, what you want is wage increases to lead demand and price increases. And you're absolutely right. You know, I go around here outside of the main big holiday weeks, demand here after the holiday, you know, just absolutely crumbled. I mean, literally overnight, things just dried up. And everyone says, well, it's the slow season. But to me, Jeff, it seems almost slower than normal. I mean, the fact that I can walk into restaurants and get a table or get a parking spot at some places, maybe even get in the line for a ride that's not terribly long. This is not quite exactly normal. And so what I'm seeing is people spending a little bit less money than they normally would. And my question that I'm kind of wondering is, as we get into the peak summer season, which of course we know energy prices, electric bills are going to go way up. Are people going to be traveling and showing up here? I have a hunch that maybe they're not. Yeah, they've been, you know, I think that's been the big economic theme overall is that on the surface in some of these economic accounts, the economy seems fine, but yet we keep running into the same pattern, the same idea all over every time. Is that, okay, the numbers look good, but nobody feels like it's good. Nobody feels like the economy's booming. Most of all, small business owners, 
the NFIB's uh, Small Business Owner Optimism Index has plummeted to its lowest level in what, over 10 years. And business owners say, we've got cost pressures that we can't pass along to our customers at the same time as we're actually seeing slowdown in sales, if not a contraction in sales, which gets back to discretionary spending. We have an enormous problem in the U.S. economy that is already expressed much better outside the U.S., but in the United States, these things don't add up. When you stop and look at the situation objectively, it doesn't add up. It doesn't square. Like you just, I think what you just said was the most important thing. If demand was rising because wages are rising and the economy is actually booming, consumer prices would follow along and there would be a natural sort of sort of equilibrium there. Equilibrium is the wrong term, but you know what I mean. There would be a e much, much better match in a dynamic world, whereas now we have the opposite. We have all the wrong factors that are leading and they're not leading into the, in the direction of a booming economy. They're leading to a situation where people are, yeah, GDP is great, but I don't feel anything like that. Small businesses, medium-sized businesses, we can't get loans from the bank, even though we would like to expand. We probably can't even think about doing that. So there's so many different little hangups that just haven't, haven't shown up in all the statistics. And the funny thing is with the beige book, the Fed is actually saying it. It's saying it out loud. Yes, we, we actually see that the economy isn't living up to its reputation. You know, Jeff, it's interesting to me that you mentioned retail sales because on a nominal basis, the market seems to be saying, hey, look, it's looking pretty good. And I keep saying, well, hold on, stop for a second. If you inflation adjust the numbers, and I know subtracting the CPI from retail sales isn't the probably proper way to do it, but it's the best thing we tool we have. And what it shows is one very clear fact that yes, the value of retail sales in a dollar amount are increasing, but retailers due to inflation aren't feeling it. In fact, it's the opposite. Yes, they're selling things at a higher price. They're selling less of them. And that means, of course, what you said with the NFIB data is that, hey, their confidence of small business owners is plummeting. And for good reason. They want to mark these things up. They want to sell them. And they do that. And fewer people walk in their doors and buy them. And that ultimately, at some point, as we see, is going to lead to fewer hours to their employees. It's going to lead to more layoffs. And perhaps as they see their insurance costs rising, they're going to have absolutely no choice because in the end of the day, they're going to have to defend their profit margins. And this is something I don't think a lot of people understand is companies are not going to sacrifice their bottom line to have people standing around doing nothing because they're afraid if they do that and things get worse, well, there goes your business simple answer starts to become cut hours, cut ads. Exactly. And, you know, I think we have this picture of where employment actually comes from. It's all big companies and large multinational firms. And you're right. Multinational firms are not going to take the hit to the bottom line because they've got a stock price to continue to see go up. But really what maybe people don't appreciate or don't really know is that most employment growth, especially over the longer term, comes from smaller businesses that become medium-sized businesses. And the vast majority of employment growth comes from medium-sized businesses that become larger businesses. But if we strangle that um, growth potential in the crib, like we're seeing with small businesses right now, they're more worried about, am I going to be in business next year than taking advantage of maybe there's an opportunity there. And so rather than hiring a couple additional workers as they might, they're simply sitting here in survival mode thinking, at some point, you know, I've only got a couple of workers as it is. I might have to let one or two of these go because the, the business does not line up to the overall impression that we're given by GDP. And by the way, with GDP, I know everybody thinks the economy is booming. But if you plot GDP against the trend, the, the 2010s trend, we're still behind. We're still way behind the 2010s trend. And we're, now, we're not even the same galaxy as the, the pre-2008 trend which is just as what you were saying, Steve. Nominally, everything looks okay, but in real terms, we keep falling further and further behind. And that further and further behind for businesses as well as consumers and workers, it's that's the vastly more important part of it than, say, the payroll number. You know, Jeff, I got to ask you a question. Since you brought GDP and we know the number looks pretty good, how much of that is inventory building? Because we hear from companies like Tesla, and hey, we got all these cars and no buyers. We're starting to hear from other companies. Uh, we built it and they didn't show up. But inventory building does factor in the GDP. 
And I think what we're talking about here with the beige book is demand is going down, discretionary spending is going down. And yes, you can have a good number on inventory built, but what happens in the quarters following if you don't sell it? Yeah, the GDP numbers in particular had some puzzling inventory numbers because they were so good. Um, the inventory was much higher than some of the other statistics from like the Census Bureau on wholesale or retail inventories. In GDP, there was a, a substantial inventory build to end last year, which contributed positively to the the overall numbers. Now, it wasn't the, it wasn't responsible for the majority of the increases in both of those quarters, the third quarter and fourth quarter, but it added something. And as Steve, you're pointing out here, especially as oil prices and gasoline prices go higher again and discretionary spending becomes comes under pressure, that inventory is going to act like an anchor around not just the manufacturing sector, but the services sector. Retailers and wholesalers are going to experience another round of probably an invent a mini, mini inventory cycle. And it, it contributes more to the downturn and the weakness that we're all feeling everywhere else. And one last quote I want to read from the Beige Book here. Just because it's it, it, it doesn't match GDP, it doesn't match any of the numbers. It says the very first one, overall economic activity expanded slightly on balance since late February. 10 out of 12 districts experienced either slight or modest growth, up from eight in the previous report. So that's positive, while the other two reported no changes in activity. So even the beige book, again, make it make of it what you will, because it again, it, it's it's just anecdotes, it's not hard data. But this is a report the Federal Reserve comes out with and says the economy isn't booming. That's the message from the Beige Book. It's it's muddling along at best. It's 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 what we're it's what we're all really picturing when we put together all the alternative sources that suggest GDP is just not it's not the representing the real situation. You know, it's funny, Jeff, because we hear from Fed Chair Jerome Powell, you know, economy is great, inflation's a problem. And it's not just a beige book. I mean, as we're talking about right now, but you start to look at some of these regional Fed manufacturing surveys, and you can really kind of get the point that they're, the U.S. economy is kind of at an inflection point where it's starting to turn. Like it's been kind of slowing down a little bit, but all of a sudden now as higher oil prices start to kick in, we're starting to see an inflection point. And this is not a good sign. And now, does it mean inflation may not stay higher for a couple more months? Sure, they could, and the Fed could just hold rates. But based on the trend change we're seeing now, and we talked about this, that we could see kind of a transitory bounce. And then if their bottom falls out a second time, watch out below. It's starting to get the picture that that's what's really happening. Yeah, the irony here about all of this is that we say, you know, higher consumer price rates are not a booming economy. But lower consumer price rates are the are indeed the opposite reflection of the economy, because if once oil prices do go lower and they will at some point, that means CPIs will go lower because the reason oil prices are going lower is because of demand, not where oil prices are going higher, which has nothing to do with demand. It's all about non-economics of supply factors. So disinflation in CPI actually is a bad sign as far as the economy, whereas too high CPI really doesn't tell us much other than hey, Saudi Arabia and OPEC is controlling the, the supply of oil. 